Straight from the Mayor's Mouth, with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council. Hello everyone and welcome to Straight from the Mayor's Mouth. Hello there, Matt. How are you this morning? Well, as people listen to this, yes. and I'm sure we've got lots of our listeners out there that wait every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. sharp when this goes live. That's it, 10 one and boom, straight That's onto right. it. So as they get that at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, then you and I have basically just finished the Stampede, yes. which I think is a fantastic event for Dubbo. Lots of people come along to Dubbo, and I think they do a really good job organising it. So hopefully... We're sitting around chatting with each other going, gee, don't we feel good? How fantastic do I look after that extra 5Ks now? I'm hoping that's lost off me as well. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so anyway, well done to the, the organisers. Hopefully it's been a, another fantastic event. Yes. And I'm, I'm sure it will have been. And hopefully you'll Well, the weather uh, I think will be magnificent. Yeah. Um, the, the pacing will be good. Uh, I will still be at the back of the pack. There's no worries about that. But you will undoubtedly be out in front. Well, I'm not sure about out in front, but I'll be, I'll be <laughs> putting 110% Put 110% whatever, in, which is outstanding. That's right. Whatever that means. Indeed. All right. Mate, let's jump into it. Uh, so, look, um, uh, talking about events and things, uh, last uh, Friday night, uh, you were a very, very brave man, and you went and did the, the sleep out there at the Old Dubbo Jail. Um, first of all, I suppose, uh, was it cold? It wasn't actually that bad, and wasn't I'll it? tell you a secret that I'll pass on for people that want to do it in the future in a minute, mm, but mm. overall, the temperature wasn't too bad on Friday night. I think it only got down to about four degrees, which right. wasn't horrendous. I mean, it's still a bit chilly. That's not too bad. But it really is a... Nice event. Mm. Vinnie's run it. It's a fundraiser for Vinnie's, but also just trying to expose the plight of homeless people. Yeah. And Vinnie's talk about the fact there's 122,000 Australians experiencing homelessness. Mm. And so their sleep outs really just try and let other people who normally sleep in a nice warm bed in a nice yes. warm house just to experience sleeping rough. It's not really the same because you turn up in your nice warm clothes and you have a yep. nice warm sleeping bag and you've got food that's provided there and you've probably had something to eat that day and yes. you know the next morning you can go back home and, and have a shower. And it's social company and it's all of those other factors yeah. too, isn't it? Yeah. But it just gives you a little bit of insight into it. Mm. What's the nice twist here in Dubbo? Because these are done obviously in more places than just Dubbo. Mm. The nice twist, of course, is the fact that we're doing it at the jail. I like how you refer to it as a nice twist. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some people who are very, very um, you know, definite in the fact that there are ghosts or spirits that yeah. are there. Did now, you see any? Did you hear well, anything? Well, there are there are eight people that were hung there. Right. There are some people that have been buried there. Now, council has never dug up those people. We know they're mm. there from sensors that we've used on top of the ground, but mm. we've never dug them up to see exactly who they are. But presumably it's three of the, the eight people that were there, right. that were hung there. And so there are people that are convinced that, yes, there are some spirits, the, the, there are some things happening. The spirit of the dead lives. There and, they are. And there are some people who have said to me, there's no way I would do the sleep out at the jail because of mm. the ghosts or the mm. spirits are like there. The it's supernatural. So w- right. where did you sleep? Well, there were various spots. You could sleep anywhere. You had okay, access you to you the, had the jail. Pick of it. Yeah. You could go... Out in the grassed area, you could go under a covered area, in one of the cells, in the infirmary, wherever you like to go. Right. One thing that I find fascinating in the jail is a solitary confinement area. Oh, don't tell me. And when you go into there during the middle of the day, you walk in, it is pitch black. You put your hand in front of your face. You did not sleep in the solitary confinement, did you? And you cannot see your hand. So oh, I thought no. of all the places to it. go, thought, <laughs> it's got to be dark, surely. So that's a good oh, thing. Oh, no. But I think, I mean, they used to put people in there as punishment, obviously. Yes. And I think the story was that they'd lock people up there for, say, 24 hours. Right, mm. Mr. Barnes, you've been mucking up. Mm. We're putting you in the solitary confinement. Mm. We'll see you again in 24 hours' time. I reckon that would have been enough to make you go crazy. You starve completely of any visual input. Mm. You probably haven't got much audio input because they're very thick walls around that. You probably wouldn't even, maybe you would have been fed in that 24 hours, but you wouldn't have had any social interaction for yep. 24 hours. So I thought, what a great place to try sleeping. <laughs> Only you would turn around and say those words in front of that sentence. I thought it'd be a great place to go sleeping. <laughs> it was a bit freaky. Now, my, <laughs> my youngest daughter happened to be home from university, so I said, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's go down and sleep at the jail. And she thought I was a bit crazy. But anyway, she came along for the, for the experience know. as well. So Your poor daughter. <laughs> That's right. So you dragged her into the solitary confinement as well with you. I suggested that we should go in there. <laughs> and she willingly accepted this. Well, she accepted it. I'm not sure if it was willing, but she accepted it. But we went along there and we got in our sleeping bags. And so it was a bit freaky. Mm, it was very bit, dark. Really? Mm. It was, yeah. The, the one advantage, and this is a tip for people that want to do this in future years, is that 
it was actually quite reasonable in terms of temperature. Yes, it still got down to yeah, four right. degrees, yeah. but there was no breeze in there. So you actually found that the temperature was when we spoke to everyone in the morning. You could have put a jacuzzi into that place <laughs> with air conditioning and a private butler, and I still wouldn't have slept in there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but in the morning, people were talking about how cold it was. And I went, oh, actually, it wasn't too bad, the solitary confinement. <laughs> but again, it still was pretty freaky. The other thing that's a bit of an added twist when you do it mm. at the jail is you've got the clock tower next door. So it's dinging at 1 a.m., oh, 2 a.m., oh, and 3 a.m. Yeah, I forgot all about that. Yeah, and so people did talk about that. Some of the people had earplugs they put in before they oh, went no. to, to sleep. I thought that's cheating a little bit. Yeah. But I thought it might have been a bit quieter in there, but I did get woken up at 1 and at 2 and at 3 <laughs> And you knew exactly what time. You didn't need to look at a watch. You knew exactly what time oh, it was. No. Well, well done, may I say. That's very impressive. Uh, not only impressive to do the sleep out, but incredibly impressive to do the solitary confinement. <laughs> I can tell you now that is something I will never be doing. Now, during the week, uh, you had a chance to catch up with um, a representative there from the Commonwealth Bank of Australia in Wellington. Um, this has been an interesting time, hasn't it, out here in the country with the closure of so many of, of the branches. Uh, I noticed the fact that NAB, one of the the, uh, the banking institutions there, decided they're going to close up as well. But has there been some positive feedback here from the CBA? Well, I think regional banking is really important. Mm. And even though I must admit personally, I can't remember the last time I physically walked into a bank. There are some people mm. that still have passbooks and go into their bank. And there's people who still need a bank from a business perspective. Mm. They need to go and bank their cash. So having a physical bank presence is still very important. Mm. I did get a phone call, a courtesy phone call, from a senior manager from the NAB when they had made the decision to close the branch in Wellington before they closed it. And I had the discussion and I said, well, obviously disappointing because we don't like to see any services lost from Dubbo or Wellington mm. from anywhere in the LGA. And I did send off a formal letter to the CEO of the NAB to say, please don't close the branch. But more than that, it was, do you understand the activity, the economic activity that's going to occur with the res around Wellington? Because mm. maybe they weren't aware of that. Mm. And obviously when they're making a decision to close a branch, it's an economic decision. But yep. maybe if they realised what was happening there, that they might reconsider that. Is, is, sorry to interrupt you. Is that, is that one of the only things we can really do, I suppose, from the point of view of council? and in your role as the mayor there, to turn around to update these private enterprises, like obviously a bank's a private institution. Um, it's a business decision they've made in regards to closing these banks, but obviously raising the awareness of the impact and obviously raising the awareness of potentially what could be the increase of population in these areas as well. Any legitimate, legal, honest angle to try and keep them open, absolutely right. So mm. it's not just a, hey, don't close it, mm. and obviously I have no power. Council has no power to make a bank stay open. We have no power to direct a business to open or close mm. unless they're doing something illegal, obviously, and unless mm, it was against right. a DAA condition. But effectively, it's really just a, on behalf of the community, we really like you to stay please, yes, with a smile. Yes, absolutely. And that's about the best you can get. Now I got a yeah. lovely letter back from the NAB explaining the economic reasons they were closing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It didn't change their decision. Mm. The Commonwealth Bank, I had the opportunity, there was an area manager that happened to be in Wellington. The branch manager spoke to me and said it'd be good for you to speak to the area manager. Absolutely. Mm. So again, I want to have that conversation with the Commonwealth Bank. What was emphasised to me in that meeting was that only a, a month ago, the Commonwealth Bank made an announcement to say that their branch network they were not closing any branches. They gave a guarantee, a moratorium, if you like, right. to the end of 2026. So at least it gave okay, so it's everyone, a couple of years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It gave everyone the opportunity to say, yep, at least they're keeping them open. Mm. We've got some sort of time frame. And if we really want to get away from our old passbook or change our habits, maybe we do it then. But mm. it doesn't mean they're going to close in 2026. Mm. It's just they've given a guarantee. I wanted to have the conversation with the area manager to make sure that guarantee definitely applied to the branch in Wellington, mm. but what other banks are doing as well is they're using post offices to do a lot of their banking. Okay. Now, it's almost like outsourcing it a bit. It is, and they can do many of the things a branch can do. Not everything a branch can do, but they can do many of the things. But one thing I thought was quite clever from the Commonwealth Bank is they, during COVID, there were obviously a very tough argument to put mm. forward to keep lots of businesses open because you couldn't have people come into a lot of businesses. Yes. Banking was an essential service, but obviously nowhere near as many people were coming through the door. What the Commonwealth did, which I thought was quite clever, is they said, well, we're going to keep the branch open, but we're going to keep it open half a day. So you still have access to your banking services. Mm. You might have to adjust when you do your banking. But the other half of the day, rather than say to our staff, sorry, we only need you for half a week now, mm. they then tied the other staff into the call network. So when you pick up oh, the phone and ring the right, Commonwealth okay. Bank, yes. it goes through to someone 
anywhere in Australia. So right, right. someone sitting in Wellington after one o'clock, they go and have their lunch, they come back, and then they basically log into the call network. So right, the branch is right. closed, yep. but they're still being useful, so they're mm. still getting paid, obviously. Mm. And so then they get calls from all over Australia. Mm. And I actually did say to the branch manager, so do you get many calls from Wellington? They said, oh, every now and again, yes. I get someone to call through, and we know each other. So mm. straight away, you know, or they, they know they're from Wellington, for example, yeah. but Again, that's a rare occurrence because they're getting calls from wherever it might be. So I thought that was quite clever. Yep. So the good news is that, firstly, the Commonwealth Bank will be open at least until the end of 2026. The second part of the news is that the ATM there in at the Commonwealth Bank branch, which is right beside the council building, yes. the ATM there is the only ATM. Now, there's some you know, there's little kiosk ones that you see. Mm. There's a couple of those. But as yep. a full-blown ATM, that's the only one there in Wellington. Right. So that's incredibly important for yes. Wellington. And they did talk about the fact that if there's any error or it runs out of cash, whatever it might be, they know about it very quickly because mm. people can't go anywhere else. Mm. And they actually said, it seems like you think it would be great to have a monopoly, but they said, if you're talking to other banks, can you say to the other banks that might come along to Wellington, please put an ATM in mm. because it's actually really important for yeah, Wellington. absolutely. On the back of the NAB, what I did do is I did send a letter to any local banking institutions, and again, I, I've got to be very careful not to be biased, mm. but any organisations that are local or regional, and I said, essentially, there is no NAB in Wellington anymore. If you'd like to open up in Wellington, there's an opportunity there for you. We can't give them anything special. Yep. We can't go and pay rent for them or, or give them any subsidies, but it was just alerting them to that. Mm. And on the back of that, I know there are some other banks or credit union type local yeah. organisations, not the big four, yeah. but some other local ones that might be looking at Wellington. Well, let's have a look, uh, talk about that very briefly then in regards to that, because there are quite a few smaller banks around like Bendigo Bank and others, that sort of smallest type of stature, the next tier down, mm. that seem to be sort of making headways into the country town areas and, and are becoming quite popular, I'd suggest, at those country towns because they're there. Um, is there any indication of any of those type of groups coming into Wellington? Only the fact that I've sent that letter to them and, and suggest mm. that, and there have been some discussions there, but nothing definite out of that yet. But it really, again, it's one of those things that sometimes as council, as the mayor, what you're trying to do is just alert people to an opportunity. Mm. Again, you can't go and say, I've got a mate who yeah. is in a certain bank. I'll get him to move into that space. Obviously, that would be entirely inappropriate. Mm. But alerting people, letting them know about it, talking about it on a podcast mm. so that anyone else goes, well, there's an opportunity there in Wellington. Yeah. And I don't have any data to suggest this, but I'm sure there'll be some people in Wellington who used to bank with the NAB who would now say, well, I don't want to keep banking with an ad if they're not here. I might move to another branch yes. that has a physical presence in Wellington. Yeah. So there's a potential opportunity there for anyone, including the Commonwealth Bank, yeah. to take advantage of that. Absolutely. Now, now this has been uh, an interesting little one here, Matt, that's, uh, and it appears as though it's all about to begin. Um, I'm going to start off with a broader sort of a suggestion that Around the Ollie Robbins Oval there, there's, there's been a, a, a master plan being put in place there in regards to an entertainment precinct. And as part of what I'd suggest the starting of this, there's there's been a significant uh, moment that's happened during the week. The Legacy Shared Pathway Sod Turning. Now, it may not sound all excited to the listeners straight off to hear that, like a bit of sod turning, but this is actually the start of potentially what is a major project down here at Ollie Robbins Oval. So, so talk us through it. What happened, first of all, with the sod turning? What are we looking at here with this uh, shared pathway, and what's the future looking like for this area? You're right. The future is probably the more exciting part. The shared pathway will be great. Mm. At the moment, you've got Ollie Robbins Oval, you go down behind Bly Street, and essentially you've got an area there now where cars can access it. So there's a bitumen area, yes. there's a boat ramp down behind the back of Church Street, and then beside that you've got a little white fence, and then you've got a part of the track and Riley cycleway. Mm. There was some money around during the amalgamation during the last council, so Dubbo Regional Council received some money during that, and there were projects they put forward. Yep. One of the projects they put forward was the idea of an elevated walkway, oh. which I think would have been fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Sounds but, interesting. How yeah, much would that have cost? Too much. Yeah. <laughs> Way okay, too much. Right, okay. And so, again, having a, a walkway out mm. over the river, going mm. out mm. Uh, oh, along over the riverbank, you, you, yeah, I think it would have been absolutely fantastic. But mm. that would have blown the whole budget of all the projects that were put yeah, forward, yeah, okay. and then some. Yep. So it had to be scaled back somewhat. So the scaling back essentially will mean that that bitumen and tracker area there will be replaced with one concrete 
and a coloured concrete, probably an ochre yeah. type colour will be yeah. used there. So about 320 metres along that particular area there. Okay, so is that going to start uh, at the Riverdale end of Ollie Robbins Oval and go up towards near the bridge, or is that the to plan? The, to Church Street, basically. To so Church Street, to, okay. To that area there. So yeah. about 320 metres. Yep. And then that will replace that with, again, the idea of a shared pathway is that, yes, you could have cars go along there and mm. people. It'll be wider. It'll be the bitumen and the truck O'Reilly together. Okay, that's a pretty serious size width. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. And the reason for that is that then, and, and sorry, going along with that theme of having the elevated pathway, for example, mm. because of that too much expense, mm. the idea will be some areas where you'll be able to look out. So four oh, nice. lookouts along that area there. So along that 320 metre stretch, you're yep. going to have three little areas you can sort of go out and have a look out at the river and sort of step out over and bit of a viewing platform area. Yeah, four, four actually, but yeah, four okay. viewing platforms there. Oh, nice. They'll go out. And in terms of some of the work that our staff do now that I mm. think is exceptional, when you start to build those out, you need to put some piers in the ground to support those. There are many trees on there. We want to make sure we protect yes. anywhere that we possibly can. Yep. Protect those big red river gums down there. There's a lot of beautiful yeah. ones down there. Beautiful and, bi- and big. You are absolutely mm. right. There are some huge ones mm. down there. So what they've done with that is they've actually done some radar or use some radar technology to look under the ground there oh, wow. to where they might put piers in. They can see roots under the ground there down to about five centimetre diameter roots, wow. so fairly small roots. Yeah. And then they can work out where to put those piers based on not damaging the roots of those trees. It's amazing, isn't it? Like and they've actually changed the type of piers they'll use right. to make sure they get around yeah. those. So that's fantastic and, yeah. and great So you protect use. the trees as well as uh, making sure that the viewing pa- platform is looking fantastic for everyone too. Yeah, that's right. But then, mm. as you said, the more exciting part is that the big picture is to get to the point where we have an entertainment precinct down there. Right. That'll involve more construction, more money, obviously, for that. But the Ollie Robbins Oval and the natural amphitheatre you've got mm. there will really open up that area. So that plan is you'll have almost a double-sided entertainment area, a larger area on one side and a smaller area on the back of that. So you'll be able to hold events. But when you're holding these events, that whole shared pathway mm. will be a fantastic area that people can move along yes. or you might be able to have food vans set up yes. along there, a whole range of different things. But step one which, as you say, it's not that exciting. Dug a little hole in the ground and flipped yep. a bit of soil over. Okay, away you go. We've got David Payne Constructions won the tender for that. So Wonderful. They're into it already. People would see fences up around some of the areas there now. Yep. So that's all underway. The amenities block is unavailable at the moment. Is there a time frame on this? So probably March next year, okay. sometime around there, that should be available. So essentially that amenities block there mm. will be out of action for that time just because of the fencing mm. that's around there and the work that's being done. But again, step one, mm. great. Step two will be absolutely fantastic. Did we know when step two is meant to be kicking off? Or is there a plan for attack for that? If and when. We've got to make a final decision sure. on that. So okay. at this stage... There are potential plans for what might happen there, what it might look like, and mm-hmm. obviously money is an important part of that. That's the plan, yep. and I think it will happen, yep. but it's still got to be resolved. Yep. The council happen and resolved on a I love frame. the fact it's uh, finally starting to begin. That's, and that's the important part here. This mm. is step one of what might be several steps. Mm. Now, I know we've talked about this a couple of times in the podcast uh, the last 12 months or so there, Matt, the... Uh, once a, once a quarter, you, you catch up with the commander of the Irana Midwestern Police District. And uh, right now, the commander is a guy by the name of Superintendent Tim Chin. Now, you had a chance to have a catch up here with uh, Superintendent Chin during the week. Um, how did the discussion go? How are things looking here right now? Are there any major points of concern that he's uh, pointed out to you? Or is there any points of concern you've pointed out to him? Well, one of the interesting things, and, and I did say this to Tim when we met with him, so it's myself and the CEO go along and, and meet with the superintendent every three months, and that's been a practice even in Dubbo City Council days. I remember Stan Single, for example, I used to meet with on a quarterly basis. So again, it's just to make sure we've got lines of communication open. Is there anything we can do for each other to help out? Mm. Obviously, we don't control the police. I can't walk into that meeting and say, Tim, I need you to put 10 extra mm, people here. Yeah, and, and I want it now. Yeah, get it yeah. sorted for me. You say, there's the door there, man. See you later. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And again, it's really about that open lines of communication. Make sure we've got those open mm. lines of communication. Make sure we understand each other and can help each other in any way we can. He did talk about the fact that they've got some new recruits coming. Okay. And that's yes. good news. But the other part of that, which was interesting, is that in a previous rollout of recruits, we had one taken away from us for some reason. And Tim said, and I was told at that one that Dubbo was owed one. Right. So, or, or more 
technically, if you like, the Arana Midwestern Police District is owed one. So he said in this latest rollout of recruits, they said, great, we know the numbers we're getting there, but remember, I'm owed one. So there's one extra. I want the extra as well. That's right. So he'll, he'll go and argue the toss on that one, which Excellent. is fine. But again, I, I think it comes down to just some of the programs that seem to be working. Mm. The PCYC, that seems to be very effective. And we had a bit of a discussion about those programs they have with PCYC, where they do some things on Friday nights, for example, mm. Project Huawei, we've talked about before. When the PCYC moves, and that'll move as part of the CSU redevelopment for that sports precinct up near CSU, mm. we did talk about the fact that that might make it a bit more difficult for some people to get to PCYC because around the CBD, a bit easier to get to than out near CSU. Mm. So we might have a bit of a think about that. Yep. Are there any programs we could run where we might have buses? And they do some bus pickups now, but any other government grants we could get, we might have to apply for them under council or under police or mm. do them jointly where we could have more transport programs so we can make sure that the kids still get to some of those programs that mm. are needed. So it's little things like that. That's not urgent today, yep. but it's something that as we go forward, bring up various discussions with how can we help there. The other thing Tim did talk about is the fact that There'll be times in the stats, so we know, know about BOXAR stats. Yes. They're done quarterly, but it takes... Because the next one to those will be out soon too, won't they? Well, they seem to take too long, and that's the problem. Yeah, right. So the last quarter finished over a month ago, yeah, two say, months I'm, ago. I'm sure we're at the point where we should be getting the new lot coming through. You'd think so, but mm. it seems to take, oh, I think, normally two, two and a bit months before they come through. Mm. But they see data on the ground more almost daily, mm, and mm. they don't have a reporting mechanism to the public from that, mm. but they get a bit of a feel, and Tim said that they've actually been going fairly well recently, and again, sometimes it comes down to a small number of individuals can make a large increase in the crime Which stats. is going to be my next question to you. Is, is um, A couple of months back, we, we, we spent a fair bit of time talking about uh, crime in Dubbo, and the perceived nature of crime in Dubbo was probably more of the focus, wasn't it? You mm. know, the, the fact that there, there was issues of the burnout cars and the people were quite up in arms about uh, the nature of that. That all, from a perception point of view, seems to have calmed down a lot, is, is my way of sort of putting it. Um, and again, we talked about this, about what we see and uh, the visual nature of that. Did, did Tim talk about anything there in regards to the fact that he feels as though that has settled around the place because of the perception of that? We're not getting as much coming through on the, the Facebook posts and the, 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 the rantings and the call for crime summits and all those sort of things seem to have died down. Um, I'm assuming, it's a bit like a sort of saying, the small number of people who are creating those issues, I'm assuming right now, aren't necessarily sitting anymore in our community. They're probably sitting behind a jail somewhere. And I know you're in solitary confinement. I'm pretty sure some of those blokes might be sitting in their own little solitary areas right now. <laughs> Um, is this is this what Tim's seeing too? Is this yeah, and again, he, he can't show any data, any stats to back that up. They're not public stats, but mm. certainly in those discussions, Tim felt like the police, I mean, I think they do a fantastic job mm. regardless, but I think his feeling was that some of those numbers are going down. They are getting some of these perpetrators, and some of these perpetrators are rampant mm. in the number of crimes that they can commit. Absolutely. In a night, in a week, for example. Yeah. So you might think there's lots of people out there committing these crimes, but they know that they'll get just a few individuals, mm. put them in a process. I mean, they can't put them behind bars yeah. permanently, obviously, but go through a process where they end up behind bars and yeah. the crime levels drop. The other thing that we talked about, which, again, is just general knowledge for, I'm sure, many people in police, is that they've got some programs in place where they'll try and work with people that come out of jail. Mm. So, I said police do that too, do they? Well, they do some things that not everything is scripted that the police do. I think they typically try and work with the community to get mm. great outcomes. I, I think mm. the police do a fantastic job and my hat's off to them. I don't want to do that job, but I'm yeah, glad some absolutely. people do want to do right. that job. Yes. And so they'll work with some individuals sometimes just to try and work out ways to keep them from going down a life of crime or back yeah, in jail. That's great to hear. But one of the things, and again, it seems obvious, but and I'm sure obvious to people in law enforcement, but I think it's, it's worthwhile pointing out that there'll be times when they'll have some individuals that come out and they'll work with them, have a bit of a chat to them, see how they're going, mm. and they seem to be going along fine. And then there'll be another individual that might come mm. out, and they might be very negative influence on mm. these other people. And so these people that might be easily swayed, suddenly, hold on, you're going along fine you're going for the so last three well months. And all of a sudden, yeah, you know, what's Joe happened? Block turns up, and it's a whole different ball game. And that's exactly the point. So then mm. a second individual comes out, mm. or a couple of them might, and then. Come on, Barnsey, what are you doing, mm. mate? Yeah. What are you going and doing an honest job for? Come mm. and join us. We're, we're going to this place tonight. We've got this great scam set yeah. up or whatever it might and be. the cycle continues. Correct, that's mm. right. So that's a real issue for them. They see that over and over and over. Mm. How do you stop that? How do you keep some of these 
leaders, if you like, yes. behind bars. And yeah. the, the reverse can be true. There can be leaders in a positive way as well. Mm. And I think the police are very leaders in a much very leaders in a mm. positive way. But this is the ongoing issue. And again, you want people to be rehabilitated. You want people mm. to not be behind jail. It's not a great place to be. But you also want society to be safe. And that's the, the ongoing challenge for our whole law enforcement system. That's exactly right. Last Thursday night, uh, you did the trek out there to Wellington and held the, the council meeting. Um, now, it's a fair bit uh, happened there last Thursday night in regards to it. So we, there's a few things I just want to talk to you about in regards to this today, Matt. And we're going to start off, we talked about Saxa Road um, a couple of podcasts back in regards to the, the problems that have been created there with the flood damage. And, and I know that uh, there was a, a working party meeting that uh, put forward a couple of suggestions to go to council in regards to how to correct this problem. And this is particularly in regards to putting in a, a, a bridge was one of the key areas of focus, uh, something that's going to last the next lot of uh, floods and that as well. So what was the decision? Because it sounds like a decision's been made now. So, yeah, it was good to go to Wellington. I like going to Wellington. We go there on a regular basis. They're scheduled 12 months in advance for the different meetings that we have in Wellington. And it was actually a pretty big meeting. I, I'm trying to remember. I think we finished at about 9.36 p.m. So we start the briefings at 4 o'clock. So you, a big, you, big meeting. Yeah, so yeah. You, you start the briefings. You start the formal council meeting at 5.30. So you're still there at 9.36 mm. in this case. So, mm. yeah, it, it's good. And I, I love the debate that goes on and lots of discussions. And councillors are obviously... Eight of the councillors have never been on council before, mm. so they're getting into the swing of things and really getting the hang of the debate and Excellent. throwing their different ideas Excellent. around. So, yeah, I, I quite Conference enjoy council meetings. starting it up now to feel as though they've got an opinion, they can use it and things like that. All of that stuff, yeah. That's great. Fantastic. So, Saxa Road, so the standing committee meetings from two weeks ago sent through the recommendations to the council meeting, as we've talked about before. Standing committee meetings don't make council resolutions. Mm -hmm. They make recommendations. Then they go through the council meeting and then they can be debated again. And Saxa Road was debated a little bit. And I understand fully the logic of that. We could spend $470,000 on fixing up the culvert, basically back to what it should have been before or what it was before. And we'd get that money back from the state government in disaster recovery funding. Mm -hmm. So essentially zero cost to council yep. and we'd have something back there that was the same as before. But we know every time we get a bit of rain, down comes the water. That's goes right. Over the, the same problem, and the four hundred seventy thousand dollars gets washed away again. Well, not always washed away, but at the very minimum, you can't use it. Mm. And then I reckon every ten years or so, Mitchell Creek gets up high enough that it does mm. enough damage to the causeway that you're probably going to replace it every ten yep. years. The focus from the last government and this government is if you've got a story to tell about betterment, mm. or you can clearly demonstrate spending extra money is better long term, mm. then. We want to be. Yeah, we've talked about this before. This betterment policy. I, I like the idea. It's, it's it's probably finally a bit of proactiveness. I'd suggest. And, you know, let's not simply try to replace it. Is this the best option for replacement? When we maybe should be thinking more about what is a better option, the betterment. Yeah, that's right. And this mm. will what we've proposed, and again, what council ended up going ahead with on Thursday night was to put a bridge in at the one in one hundred year flood level. So, right. in other words, it's a a one percent chance that that bridge will go underwater. But yeah. when there's small floods and when that Mitchell Creek gets a bit of water going through it, which would normally be over a culvert, mm. people will be able to go across that bridge with no concerns and continue on. Which the type is, of bridge did we go with? What, what was the end result with that? Well, we'll still go for both. We did talk about the two different types, the the boxed culvert or mm -hmm. a, a normal bridge. Mm. We'll still go to tender and see which is going to be better. Okay. I suspect the bridge is going to be better, but let's wait and see what the data comes back with. Yep. But the big difference there, of course, is $470,000 or for the bridge option, about $2.7 million is the estimation. Are we going to source funding if we go that way? Is that the way we do it? And this is the problem. We're not absolutely guaranteed the $470,000, but we're pretty much, yes, mm. you fix it up, disaster recovery funding, you'll get that. Mm. The betterment funding, you're not guaranteed that. We'll put the story together and say, this is what we're going to do, this is how it will work, and this is why we need this extra money. Mm. And we're a pretty good chance of getting the disaster recovery funding basing mm. on that, but you're not 100% guaranteed I suppose you're not 100% guaranteed the 470 either, but you're mm. pretty well. It's, it's pretty definite on that one. But it's the right thing to do yep. by the community there. It's been a long time they've had that. We are Dubbo Regional Council. We've got 7,536 square kilometres to look after, yep. not just, oh, that's the old Wellington Shire. Let's give them a lower level of service. So I think it's the right thing to do, and I'm pretty confident we'll get that betterment funding. If not all of it, 
a large chunk of that. Mm. And again, we are still responsible for roads, and that's a regional yeah. road, but we're still responsible for those So roads. it falls under regional roads. That's part of the regional roads section, so it's not like a state government-based road, that Saxa Road area? Saxa Road is a regional road. Okay. Yes, it certainly used as a regional road. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. So again, yes, all of those things make sense. There are some councillors who would say, I don't think it's the best thing to spend our money Mm. on, but ultimately council decided to go ahead with that and we'll seek funding under the bridge replacement program, even though it's not a bridge, Mm -hmm. okay, it was a culvert, but it's putting a bridge in there, that's right, and we'll also look at the disaster recovery funding arrangements again to have that. So I think we'll get the majority of that money, I'd hope we get all of it, but we'll get the majority of that money for that and I think we'll end up with a better outcome. And if we don't get the funding, that then goes back to council for another decision in regards to that? Well, no, I think think the decision of council really is that we've got to go ahead and do it and we'll pay for it somehow, but we'll get the money from a location somewhere and if we don't, it'll be a council cost as such. Mm. Remember that at this stage, council hasn't committed to expending any funds. The resolution of council was all about the tender process, starting the tender process. And if I go back to that resolution, we said that councils seek tenders for design and construction of either a box culvert crossing or a bridge to replace a damaged Kumabella crossing culvert in line with options two and three outlined within the business paper IPEC 23-34, further that council seek funding under the Bridge Replacement Program and Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements Program to supplement project costs, and lastly that council write to the Minister for Roads advising of the importance of this crossing to secure the necessary funding for the replacement crossing. Now, when you go out to tender, there is no requirement that we have to go ahead with that tender. So we can seek the funding, we can go forward under those two programs I mentioned, and we can seek tenders. Those tenders come back to council for a resolution. If, for whatever reason, we decide that we don't want to go ahead with it at that stage, or we can't get any other funding, or it just has been a change for whatever reason it might be, we don't have to go ahead with one of those tenders. But at this stage... That's the intention of council, and let's see how those tender prices come in. We have a reasonable idea of what that tender price might be, but again, we haven't committed yet to any expenditure. The downside of all of that is 16 months. Mm. That's the time frame from now, approximately, until we'll have a bridge there. And so we've got to work away with the community there because, Mm. again, it's not a great situation. Remember you told me last time that the fact the biggest problem there is actually getting hold of the... uh, I suppose, the, the stuff that makes up the bridge, the, the culverts there. Well, that's a, certainly a part of it. Mm. If you do the box culvert, that's an option that'll be tough to source those materials in the short term. But even mm. a bridge, you've got to get a contractor in and they've mm. got to have the materials. And so, yeah, it's, it's not process, easy either it? way. That's right. But yeah. that's the big problem is just getting that whole process done. When at the moment you've got a culvert, which is not suitable for any heavy vehicles at all, and you've got a little crossing that goes down through the creek, which fisheries wanted to shut down initially, but we got special permission from fisheries to leave that there. Mm. That wasn't constructed by us. That was constructed by some local people there. Right. Technically illegally, yes. but we understand the need for that mm. because the detour access route... Is important. Yeah, yeah, well, the detour route is a long route. So still only open to ac- access for local traffic at the moment. Mm. But again, it's a pain that's going to take so long, but it's a great long-term outcome. Yeah. That's something that's uh, created a fair bit of debate and discussion. We'll continue to do so, I suggest. And this won't be the last I think we're going to hear about this uh, from the point of view of discussions around this. Um, Australia Day. Now, it's, it's been an ongoing discussion um, about what day and what time that uh, we hold now our, our ceremonies. So it appears as though there's during Thursday's meeting there, councils come to a decision in regards to next year the day and the times that we're going to be having Australia Day for both Wellington and for Dubbo. So so talk us through it. What day is Wellington going to be on and what day are the celebrations for or the, I suppose the uh, yeah the ceremony itself there for Australia Day here in Dubbo? So I'm going to be pedantic here. I'm going to stress the point that we're not talking about the date of Australia Day. We're that's, talking, that's, that's the truth. That's right. Exactly right. That's my bad. So that's, in <laughs> that's the introduction right. of that, it's not Australia Day will still be the 26th of January. Correct. That doesn't change. But the ceremony itself in regards for the celebrations of it, there's flexibility now because we've got seven days. Correct. So Andrew Giles, the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs, as we've talked about before, made the decision to change the Citizenship Ceremonies Code. So you've got that seven-day window, three days before the 26th or three days after. Now, that's only 
for the ceremony. Australia Day, 26th of January. Doesn't change. There was no discussion about changing the date. What the final decision of council was, was that on the 25th of January in 2024, at 6.30 p.m., Wellington will hold their Australia Day ceremony. It's the same day as this year, or same, yeah, same time and same day as this year, isn't it? Well, it's, a, it's an hour later than oh, it okay. was in 2023, and that yep. was feedback from the event that it was a bit hot or yep. a bit hard to get there after work. Nice. At that event, we'll have an ambassador. We will be allocated an ambassador. That's how it normally works. Yep. An ambassador will talk about whatever the ambassador talks about. We'll have the, the mayor or the deputy mayor normally, but for Wellington ceremony, I this year said to the deputy mayor, it's your community, you're mm. the deputy mayor, why don't you give the council speech? So he nice. delivered that. And I'm sure that the same thing will happen. Well, again, I don't know whether I'll be mayor next year because we've got a, a mayoral election mm. in September. I don't know who the deputy mayor will be. But if it was the same mayor and deputy mayor, in my opinion, what mm. I would do is say to the deputy mayor, you do that speech again. And then we'll also have, as we did in 2023, we'll also have an Aboriginal person speak about the 65,000-year mm. context of Aboriginal people in this nation. Mm. So that'll be Wellington. Dubbo will be on the morning of the 26th of January, the same as it was in 2023, yep. and the same thing again. You'll have the three speakers. I imagine it will be the mayor. If I'm the mayor, yes, it'll mm. be me, whoever the mayor might be, and then an ambassador and also someone from an Aboriginal perspective. Yep. This year it was Lewis Burns. I'd love it to be Lewis Burns again, but again, that will be a decision from a few other points of view. We'll also put down an expression of interest for a committee for Dubbo and Wellington. That's the judging committee for the awards and making sure we've got everything right on there. And we'll also make sure that food and beverage in both locations is very much the same. Mm. So in other words, what's provided for free and what people have to pay for. Mm. Again, I I think that's a good outcome Mm. in that it's really just recognising that as survival day, let's look at something a little bit different in Wellington in particular. And again, after the ceremonies for both next year, there'll be some sort of... survey put out, there'll be yep. some opinion sought from the public and then decide what we do for 2025, but very positive move and I think adding that Aboriginal speaker in there is mm. very important as well. Absolutely. Now, and I think the other thing is too is that, uh, I suppose the next most obvious question in regards to this, um, has there, have you been in communication with any other councils uh, over this discussion in regards to what what other councils are doing? Are other councils having the ceremonies on or choosing to have the ceremonies on other days outside of the 26th of January? Well, they weren't for this year. I did mm. talk to a number of councils when we made the decision and a number of councils talked to me, as often happens in council circles, about the fact that we had one of the ceremonies the night before and wanted to know how it went. But many of the councils that I often deal with end up being some of the larger councils, which would have had more than 20 conferries through the year, so they wouldn't have had an opportunity to change it. Mm. For next year, though, they've got that ability, but it's probably a bit early at this stage for some of the councils to have made their final decisions. We've only just made our final decision Mm. now. So I think we'll probably see more discussion of this. And I wouldn't be surprised to see more councils who make the decision to have the ceremony on a different day Mm. other than the 26th of January. Because you can have the citizenship part of it now too, can't you? Which you couldn't do this year. Is that right? That was the whole point, that when you're doing the ceremony and the citizenship, that was the critical part in the ceremonies code about any community that had 20 Mm. conferees or more Mm. had to have that all done on the 26th of January. That was a critical part that was Mm. changed in the ceremonies code. So So that may encourage a few others maybe to think, well, let's do it maybe on the the night before. I I think it will, or the day after, or whatever it might be. Two days after even, that's right. So I think it will, and I'll be interested to see how many make that change now Mm. that it's official. You can talk about the Regional Council being a trailblazer, if you like, because mm. we did make that change there yeah. before and eight days before, I think, mm. it was actually made right, into yes. the citizenship ceremony code. Not that we did anything wrong, because Wellington yes. had less than 20 conferees, so we did get permission from the Department of Home Affairs that we were allowed to do that in Wellington this year, but next yeah. year, all bets are off. Everyone can do it if they want. That's good. Well, the debate is evolving, I think. Now, look, uh, moving through here um, in regards to it, there was a... Interesting one here that you might like to talk to the listeners through in regards to a notice of motion for the local government New South Wales conference. Now, this is a major conference that uh, all local governments go to every year. And I'm looking here through this and I'm seeing the fact that it appears as though last Thursday night, council has come up with an idea or a, uh, a motion that they'd like to put forward at this conference in regards to, uh, look at this, the, re- the comprehensive uh, reform of the existing code of conduct complaint system. So talk us through what is the, the, I suppose, the motion that council wants to put forward at this local government New South Wales major conference. Yeah, and just very briefly, the LGNSW conference every year, 128 councils mm. in the state, 
I don't know if all of them are a member of LGNSW, but I would suggest that either all or a majority. majority. I'd say, yeah. yeah. And so at the conference each year, there's a range of things that happen, like a normal conference where you've got presenters, you've got members of parliament come along and, and speak to us and we learn from them. Mm. But the thing that's different at the LGNSW conference to almost every other conference I've been to, in fact, there's one in Canberra called ALGA that we have each year and this one, but any other industry I've been involved with, any other conference I've been to, I've never seen this same process mm. where you have a big council meeting, effectively. A so, big council, like what, 600 delegates or something sitting around <laughs> Something like that. Right, and, yes. and so you get, essentially, all the councils that are going to attend can put forward a notice of motion, just like at a council meeting, a council mm. can put forward a notice mm. of motion. Mm. And then at that conference, you might have a couple of hundred of these notices of motion, yep. and then whatever council wow. has put forward that. You, you don't debate all, a couple of hundred, do you? Pretty much, yeah. Oh and sometimes God. there'll be ones that are similar enough right, okay. that the executive of LGSW might combine those and they say, it might be Dubbo and Orange and Bath has put forward a, a mm. motion that said essentially the same thing, so we've wrapped it all up into mm. one. But you essentially sit there and you move. So I, this motion that's now been resolved by council, I'll move that motion at the meeting, some will second that. Yep. I'll speak to the motion. There'll be debate back and forth at the actual conference. And then at the end of all that, It'll be all those in favour, all those against. Wow. And if this, and I'll talk about the motion in a moment, but if this motion, for example, is successful, if that yep. gets up at the conference, yep. then that is essentially a policy of LGNSW to go and talk to the state government. Right. So okay. it, the, any of these policies, then, okay, that's now a policy of LGNSW, and now we need to push that forward. Mm. And so what they can then do is they can go to state government and say, we've got a policy position that's mm. been decided on by all of our mm. members, majority of our members, yeah. in a democratic, open way, this is now something we would like you to consider on behalf of our members. Well, it's a great advisory board. It is. It's a fantastic <laughs> it's a very advisory, impressive board. advisory board. Now, this particular one relates to the Code of Conduct, and there has been some discussion mm. by both the last government and this government, by the minister, and in fact, I've spoken already in this term of government to the minister and the shadow minister. This is one of the topics they've brought up mm. in terms of doing this review of Code of Conduct. One of the problems that this motion addresses, and Councillor Jess Goff brought forward this notice of motion, mm. one of the areas it addresses is that the problem at the moment is that when you lodge a code of conduct, it goes to the CEO or the GM of a council. And that puts that particular person in a very tough spot. Mm. Is it a frivolous complaint that I dismiss before I go any further? Or do I pass it up the chain to be reviewed? And as soon as I do that, there's a cost associated with it. Mm. And if I keep doing that with a frivolous complaint or a vexatious complaint, it's going to cost council money for no reason. No, I'll knock that one out. But then the CEO or the GM could be accused of bias. Mm. A code of conduct is lodged on Councillor X and everyone says, oh, the GM likes Councillor X. Mm. He'll dismiss that straight away. A code of conduct is lodged on Councillor Y. Oh, the GM doesn't like Councillor Y. He'll definitely pass mm. it up with a recommendation about that mm. and he wants that to go further. So it puts the GM in a very tough spot given the fact that councillors only employ one person. Mm. That's the GM or the mm. CEO of a council. So you're not wanting to annoy the councillors that are the ones that employ you. Yes, that's right. So the first part of the recommendation from Councillor Goff, which was approved by council, so it's a, a, now a resolution of council to take this forward, mm. was that code of conduct complaints – about councillors specifically, be lodged directly with the Office of Local Government. Okay, so so literally bypassing the CEO, going straight to an external body. Correct. Centralise okay. the Code of Conduct Complaint System, increasing the efficiency, transparency and fairness. So that was point one. Yep. And then the Office of Local Government assumes full responsibility for the entire process. Okay. So basically, yep. don't bring it back to council. Yep. Let them Nothing run. Nothing to do with us anymore. It's, it's an external body that's going to make that decision. That's right. And let them resolve complaints. Because here's the other part mm. that's a problem. A code of conduct complaint is lodged on a councillor. Let's say the GM or CEO of a council decides it needs to go further. It goes further. The reviewer says, oh, this is actually a serious complaint. So then it goes to a more serious investigation, a more thorough investigation. So mm. there's additional costs associated right. with that. Right. Yep. And then... The Code of Conduct reviewer says, yes, this is definitely a breach of the Code of Conduct. I'll send it now back to council with a recommendation to say this needs to be dealt with. Mm. Now, council then... They have to make in, the decision. That's right, about one of their fellow councillors. Mm. So if it's a fellow councillor that might be in the majority or might have a majority of support on council, yeah. well, council laws, if they weren't doing their job correctly, mm. could say, yep, we've got that information and we'll give them a slap on the wrist mm. or we'll dismiss that with no further action required. Yep. So again, it puts councillors in a spot. So this motion said mm. that let 
the Office of Local Government go through that process and resolve complaints rather than counter laws, judging one of their peers, mm. it doesn't seem like it's right. And then the third part was that if an individual complainant lodges three or more unsuccessful complaints in relation to councillors within a single term, so not one councillor to council. So if you've got someone out there that's hell-bent on bringing down mm. ABC council and they just keep lodging complaints, and I've talked to other councillors around the state mm. And I've seen this happen where people get complaint after complaint. Logic yep. just ties up resources, wastes money, wastes time, yep. and they know they're not going to be successful. They're ridiculous complaints about the colour of your shirt mm. or about the way they voted on a certain thing. Not, it, it, It's okay to disagree with the way a councillor voted. If they think there's a process that wasn't followed correctly, mm. that might be worthy of a code of conduct complaint. Yep. But when it's just, I don't like the decision, but people lodge code of conduct complaints on that. And again, they're just frivolous complaints or vexatious. So if anyone, any individual lodges three or more unsuccessful, now if they keep lodging successful ones, yep. it's Hold a different ballgame. That's right. It's a bit like a captain's challenge in a game of rugby league yep. or a DRS review. You don't lose your review. You don't get a market your name if it's if, successful. If you're right and successful, you That's keep right. on going. And if you've got three or more unsuccessful, then this motion says that you would be deemed a vexatious complainant and then as a consequence, you wouldn't be allowed to lodge any more complaints mm. against that particular council for the rest of the council. Oh, okay, so not the, just the individual, but council in general. Oh, yeah, okay. that's right, because yep. it could be, I'll just lodge a complaint against council A, council B, council C. Mm. Sometimes you see complaints lodged along party lines. Sometimes mm. the people that just keep lodging complaints against someone mm. from another party. Mm. I hate the idea that you just get people lodging complaints on a party. Like, if someone genuinely breaches the yeah. code of conduct, yeah. absolutely, put your complaint in and let it be dealt with. Yeah. But when people are doing it for frivolous or vexatious reasons. So mm. that's, and I've paraphrased the motion there that was put through by council on yep. Thursday night, but that's the motion that will be taken forward to local government New South Wales to be debated at the conference. It's quite interesting. And, and I suppose the next question I would think about in regards to this, Matt, would be, is it, do complaints come through regularly? Is this a regular issue that, that council has to face and that... Uh, that our CEO would be dealing with on a regular basis, or is it uh, not so bad? We do get a report. It's compulsory to have an annual report that goes to council on the number of code of conduct complaints. Right. The problem is that doesn't say anything mm. about the outcomes. It doesn't say we received 10 complaints and they're all frivolous. Mm. It just has a number. Now, we as a council said we don't think annually is good enough. That's what the state government says that we must do. Yep. So we actually have those reports come through on a quarterly basis. Right. So, And we probably do talk about those when they come through and just say, hey, in the last quarter we had five complaints or ten yep. complaints. And this isn't so much about this council, this motion, because we don't get a huge number of complaints that are lodged. Mm. And certainly I haven't seen any come back to actually be... Warrant to go to the next level sort of thing. Well, we, we don't know about them. So we don't know about any complaints that might get passed on to the reviewer. The only time we as councillors would know about them is if there was an investigation done and something was found to be, yes, here's and a breach. it comes back to you guys to make a decision. That's right. Okay. So the, the CEO receives complaints. He might receive complaints about various councillors, he's not allowed to talk about those. Mm. So again, mm. that's part of the process is that it's all secret, but you have to report them. So mm. we might get the report through and we'll go, oh, there were 10 complaints lodged last quarter, Mr. CEO. Mm. Who are those about? I can't say. Mm. Can you tell me whether they're frivolous? I can't say. Mm. Did you knock them back or did you pass them a review? I can't say. So yeah, right. you don't get any information. So again, that could look bad. If someone wants to make a council look bad, they could just keep lodging complaint after complaint after complaint. Yep. They're all thrown out, but the report comes through and says... There's been 30 complaints lodged against this council. Right. Oh, no, it's a terrible council. We've got mm. all these complaints, but they're all one person lodging vexatious complaints. Mm. And that's what this part of that motion yeah. around the vexatious complaint. I can see the importance of you know, wanting to try to make a change. And I'd be assuming, too, that state government would be probably on side with trying to make some reforms in this area because it does seem as though it's, that it's open to, to issues would yeah. be probably the best way to put it. That's right. And again, both the current minister and the shadow minister, as I mentioned, are keen to see some changes mm. here. And so hopefully this helps them with that change process. The Voice... It's um, it's coming up soon from the point of view of the voting, and uh, I know it's uh, oh, probably around about maybe four or five months ago, Matt. We we mentioned uh, the nature of the voice and what council can do in regards to this, and in regards to the discussion, in regards to the debate. So on Thursday night, it appears as though maybe council has come up with the idea that uh, let's conduct a forum, let's conduct a, a, 
a, an opportunity here for people to come and to listen to people on both sides of the discussion to present their their points of view and as the reasons why they feel as though the voice should be either voted for in the affirmative or the opposed. So what's happening? What's the plan? Well, there are some councils around the state where they've actually gone out with a resolution to say, we recommend people in our community vote a certain way. And we've had some discussions with that around council laws. Mm. And again, these have been workshops and general discussions. No resolution has come forward about this specifically. But the general discussion has been, we don't think we should be out there telling our community how to vote as a council. Mm. It seems like one of the great things about a democracy is that people can go into a voting booth and without fear or favour, without having yes. threats hanging over their heads. Someone standing with a shotgun at the door and all of that vote stuff. this way. Yep. Yep. People can say yes or no, or can they, they can vote for a candidate in an election. That's one of the great parts of our democracy. Absolutely. So we, as a general council, have discussed that and said, well, we don't think we should be directing people, but gee, this is an important vote. Hmm. So how can we help people understand it's really important without directing them? Now, again, some councils have said vote yes, vote no. I know one council has got a formal resolution to say that our position on the vote is a position of neutrality. <laughs> <laughs> because, again, they didn't want to be drawn into the right, debate yeah, yeah, about yeah. what's your official position. In fact, I spoke to the mayor of that particular right. council, and he said the hard part for him was he spokesperson for the council, but someone could say to him, so what do you think individually? Well, it's pretty hard as a mayor to mm. take off your council hat and say, mm. well, individually, mm. I'm all in favour of this, because then people say, well, the mayor, well, the mayor said, said, that's, that's right. right, and he's the spokesperson, or he or she is the spokesperson mm. for the council. In this case, it was a he, but yes. he or she is the spokesperson for the council. So then people could easily interpret that to say the council position is. So that yeah. mayor that I spoke to said, the idea of neutrality is he can say, if he's asked about it, and mm. say, well... I've got a neutral position on that's this. That's right, and I'm the spokesperson for council, so I've got to have a neutral position. Yes. And we haven't gone as far as that, but certainly I've been saying to anyone that asked me, to say, well, it's not fair for council to try and direct people how to vote. Mm. Mm. But how can we do the education piece? Now, the frustrating part that I have is that we don't know a date. Mm. Now, I'm... Of a vague We're understanding. October sometime, aren't they? I think it's sort of the, the vague sort of discussion. Well, it used to be sometime between October and December. Mm. So we went, okay, that's November. So maybe sometime in November. But the latest that I read the other day was that the 14th of October might yes, be that the date. Yes, that's around there. Some, that date seems to sort of sit in my memory for some reason. And there might be an announcement on the 30th of August. Mm. And again, we're recording this before the 30th of August. That's right. So there might be an announcement on the 30th of August that the date will be the 14th of October. Mm. Now, if that's the case, I'm not a great fan of it being that soon because that's only six weeks you've mm. got to help educate people. So we need to have a motion on the books ready to go because yep. I would have preferred... preemptive plan almost. Yeah, I would have preferred to have had a date that we knew about yeah. beforehand and I would have liked a long time in advance of that date so you can really build up and you can still talk to people about this is the date. Part of the education will be make sure you get registered to vote There'll be a time frame before the referendum that you'll have yep. to be registered to vote, so it'd be nice to know those time frames. Yep. So the, the debate itself, uh, w what's your plan with that? What are you looking at doing? Well, the, the plan will be now, so the resolution of council is that we'll organise a forum. Yep. On that forum, we'll have a professional MC. His or her job will be to basically make sure that people can put their points of view across in this forum. Mm. And questions from the audience, etc. make sure that people are respectful yep. and ask questions in a respectful way and the answers are delivered mm. in, a, in a way that everyone can get the chance to have their say. What we will do is we'll advertise an EOI process to get people who want to be on the panel, a four-person panel, we decided, okay. two people who are in favour of a yes vote, two people who are in favour of a no vote. And the idea of the panel will be to put their views forward mm. and then do a Q&A through the yep. audience. We'll do it at the theatre preferably in the tiered theatre, but again, yes. depending on the time frame, yes. there might be other things booked in, so we might have to go to the flat floor rather than the tiered theatre, but our preference is the tiered theatre. We'll live stream this, so people will be able okay. to watch that, and obviously yep. they'll be able to watch the recording afterwards. So that whole process is basically starting, now I know the staff already, after the resolution on Thursday night, already started their planning on Friday right. to go through and start planning this, getting things booked in, a whole range of things, but again... We don't want to book it in for the mm. 20th of October mm. if the vote is on the 14th of October. Yep. So we need to know that date as yes. soon as possible, which you can do some of the preliminary planning.
So I suppose the next thing in regards to it is there, look, it's maybe a bit preemptive now in regards to it because it sounds like you haven't really set a date, so it's going to be difficult for people to put an expression of interest in, am I going to be available that day to speak? I don't even know a date, so I really can't put myself out there just yet to say oh, I want to be one who's going to speak. So but from the point of view of the planning, what, what can council do right now without actually having a date to work towards? And that is part of the frustration. You're mm. exactly right. We'd like people to put an expression of interest in to be available at some particular time yeah. that we don't know. And Chances are these people are busy people. That's right. And know. we'll plan that. Same with booking an MC. Mm. You try and find a professional MC. Hey, are you available on a random date that we'll pick at some later stage once we know a date for The Voice? Right. So it's yeah. a bit frustrating. We'll do a lot of the planning. We'll have the paperwork ready to go. Mm. I imagine that we'll have all our documentation ready to go. So as soon as we find out a date, we can snap our fingers and go, that's yep. it. Let's yep. make it happen straight yeah, away. Watch this space sort of thing. Watch this space. But I think I think it's a sensible way to go mm. to help educate the public, make sure you get registered to vote. It's a really important thing. And just be yeah. aware of it. Don't walk in and decide on that's the way right. in, oh, what am I going to do? Uh, yeah. I saw John outside. He said to go, yes mm. or no, I'll, mm. I'll do that, I guess. So, mm. yeah, let's make sure you're educated Education's a great thing. And Matt, also uh, on Thursday night, uh, there's been uh, some motions put forward here and decisions made in regards to the compulsory compulsory acquisition of land. Now, there's there's two areas here in particular that just want to talk about, and again, this whole notion of the compulsory acquisition of land and how council's involved with this. But th- there's two parts. Let's start off with the first one here in regards to the acquisition of land through TAFE New South Wales for road corridors connecting Central West Precinct to the Mitchell Highway. Talk me through it first of all in regards to what role does council play in, in its ability to to uh, acquire land that is already belonging to someone else. So does council have a role? Can we do this, can we? Is this part of something we can do? Absolutely right. So state government can do it, local government can do it. If you need land for a certain purpose, right. then you can have a discussion with a landowner. Yep. And if that discussion doesn't go the way you want it, you can compulsory acquire that. Okay. Or you can say, we can do compulsory acquisition. Why don't we have a discussion about it and mm. come to a better agreement rather than going through the technical process right. of compulsory acquisition. So TAFE New South Wales, this this land here that uh, looks like councils decided upon as acquiring, uh, what, what's happening here with this? So we, the, the motion went through, now this was part of the confidential part of council, so I can't talk about the discussion that happened, but yep. the outcome, anytime there's a confidential item before council, the outcome is always put out to the public. Mm. So we approved the acquisition of approximately 17,633 square metres of land and that's on one lot, and then another 2,547 square metres of land in another lot. Both of those are currently owned by TAFE New South Wales. And this is the TAFE mm. as you go out towards the airport. Oh, on, on the left-hand side out there. As you're correct, out as you're driving that, out yeah. of Dubbo on the left-hand side on the yeah. Mitchell Highway. And just to connect areas from there across, as land is developed, as housing is developed, yep. We believe there's some areas there that we need to get some good access through there. Right. Some of the developments around there are not landlocked if we don't have that land, yep. but certainly access would be a bit limited. So we've had some discussions with TAFE New South Wales. There's areas that they would like us mm. to look at more than other areas, but we think there's certain areas so that we is, want more. Is there some residential areas behind the TAFE block here that we need to get access to? Is that is that the plan for there's, residential? Correct. There's some the areas, future? there's some industrial, some residential, whole range of areas there. Okay. And so in the end, we've had some discussions initially, but we'll trigger the acquisition, and, and I'll get technical now, pursuant yeah. to section 177 and 178 of the Roads Act 993. Mm. So essentially, we've now given the CEO permission to go forward, have these negotiations further. We've had some initial discussions, mm. and if those negotiations fall over, then we can trigger that compulsory acquisition process, which is a, a yeah. technical formal process, but it means that essentially... Because we've got a need for the land, and because mm. we've got a reason behind that, we can do a compulsory acquisition of that land. So, so if TAFE turns around and says, no, nah, you're not having it, you can trigger the the acquisition, compulsory acquisition order. Correct. And okay. given the fact now there's a council resolution to do that, it gives the CEO a little bit more power mm. to sit down with TAFE and say, I've got the power to do it, mm. and we've got a council resolution to do it. I'd prefer so, to talk you through it first. Correct, that's right. Yep. And most organisations, most people, individuals or companies, or in this case the state government, when you've got that, they say, okay, well, let's 
mm. work out how we can do it in the best mm. possible way for both parties. No one really wants to do the compulsory acquisition process, but you can if you have to. Mm. Now, the second one is in regards to the Blue Ridge Link Road. Now, again, this is something we've uh, discussed uh, at length over the course of time. Uh, Sheridan Road's a real issue right now, and I know Council's got some long-term plans there for uh, fixing that up. But prior to that, Council wants to put in a Blue Ridge Link Road in. Now, as part of that, again, it appears as though there's been a compulsory acquisition of land decision made to take the land off or purchase the land off uh, the, the Diocese of Bathurst here. So yeah. what's, what's happening here with this one? And this one, again, was in confidential session, but this yeah. one had a little more of a technical glitch there in the mm. fact that I declared a non-pecuniary significant interest in this particular item yep. because I sit on a Diocese and Finance Council board, mm. an advisory board, if you, you like. You just step out of the discussion of those ones, did so you? So I did. So on that particular one, because it was a non-pecuniary, it means I don't get paid for it, so I don't get paid mm. to sit on the Diocese and board, but because it's significant and so I'm on that advisory board where I can vote to make decisions on that, yep. then I did declare that particular interest in this one. And so I left the room yep. during the debate, during the discussion, the Deputy Mayor, Richard Ivey, stepped in. He mm. ran the meeting for that particular item. And then after the meeting, then yep. they come and get me and say, right, you can continue on with the rest of the meeting. Okay. Having said that, I'm allowed to talk about it yes. because you and I are not making a decision no, in council. No, that decision the, has been made. decision has been made, so we're talking about the decision. So the, the area of land that council's looking to acquire there, where, whereabouts is this? So this is up behind the Catholic School on Sheraton Road. Okay. And we've talked about this Blue Ridge Link Road before where we want to take the traffic, the heavy vehicle traffic in particular, mm. up behind the high school uh, or high school and mm. primary school mm. and then up through Blue Ridge, so calling it the Blue Ridge Link Road, so going up through that particular area there and then once we get that heavy traffic off Sheraton Road, then we can do some major upgrades to Sheraton mm. Road for the lighter traffic that will come through there. So, so to reassure, uh, I suppose, listeners out there, this is not land that's currently like you know the, the, the back ovals here of St John's College, for argument's sake. There's there's actually land that sits in behind that, that there's nothing there right now. Is this the land we're talking about? Correct, that's exactly okay. right. So the Catholic Diocese owns a fair bit of land mm. back around there, back into the Blue Ridge area, yep. and that might have been historical. It might have been bought a long time ago when St mm. John's was first proposed for that area and before Blue Ridge was even mm. in existence, maybe even thought about. Mm. But again, there's a fair bit of land there. They've identified they don't need it, so it's probably not the end of the world for the, the diocese. But mm. again, there's a process to go through. So again, council gave the permission to the CEO to go through the compulsory acquisition process of 3,455 square metres. Mm. So that'll happen. It's under the same section of the, of the Act, of the Roads Act, under that process. So again, this is... Two different organisations, so it's yep. worth pointing out there that yes. you've got TAFE New South Wales, state government, yes. you've got the Diocese of Bathurst, so the Catholic Church, if you yep. like, that owns some land there. But because council needs that land for a specific purpose, we've got that process. Mm. Now, again, we'll go through, we'll have those discussions with the Catholic Church. I'm mm. sure we'll come to an agreement. But if we don't, if they fold their arms and say there's no way you're mm. having that land, mm. then we've got that compulsory was, acquisition process. Is, is this something that you're looking at doing in the, the next financial year? Is this uh, part of next year's budget potentially that you're going to uh, start to want to put these roads in? We want to start this as soon as possible because okay. we've got the Sheraton Road problem to fix. Yep. And so we can't fix that problem properly until we get the Blue Ridge mm. Link Road. And I did give time frames once before in a previous podcast about mm. when we'd be looking to get that Link Road going and then when we'd mm. be fix or going forward with the Sheraton Road upgrade. But yeah, again... When I say as soon as possible, things take time. Yep. But yes, as soon as possible is our Excellent. objective there. This time now, we're not talking about buying something, we're talking about selling something uh, or potentially leasing, leasing or selling, one of the two options. So there's two things here, uh, Matt, that again came up at uh, Thursday's council meeting. Uh, first of all is the land that council owns and on the, the building there at 69 Church Street. This is the, the little building sits opposite um, the main council chambers there and the, the big main block that we've got, uh, which has, I suppose, been used a bit of an overflow over the course of time for, uh, for the administrational side of things. So we'll talk about it first. So is this a, a building that we're looking at selling or mm, leasing? Leasing, yes. Leasing. Okay, here we go. And this is a confidential discussion again that mm -hmm. we had at council, but the outcome is public, as I said yep, with the previous yep. couple. So this one was a building that was bought back in 2000 by right. council, so before I was even on council, and it was bought because the staff in the Civic Admin building on, in, on Church Street there, on the corner of Church and Darling Street, was full and they needed more staff, so they bought the building across the road mm. and there were some staff that were in there. And still to this day, there were staff in there. Now, we've had the discussion before mm. where we changed the council chamber 
from being a permanent location that was tying up that space yes. to be used twice a month to be now a flexible space in our committee meeting rooms mm. so we can recover that space and actually so have this is one of the there. positive outcomes, I suppose, is the fact that now you've got a space now become something you get actually a few more bucks from because you don't need it anymore. Correct. So the advice that the staff received was that the better process for this particular building was to lease it. Mm. So we're now going out advertising for an expression of interest to lease that. Okay. Now, I don't know how much we're going to get for that, but let's say we've got sixty or $70,000 a year. Yep. By making the change to the council chamber, that sixty or $70,000 a year now goes on to our bottom line mm. so that we're not tying up that yeah, office space absolutely. or that office real estate in the building for the council chamber. So a positive from that perspective. Mm. I'll talk about the other one. Well, that's just the other thing. Like the second one there is in regards to the, the land that's opposite the pool. Mm. Uh, that's probably the easiest way for listeners is probably to get a picture of this. This is You've got the railway line, you've got the land that sort of sits next to the railway line, then you've got the pool. So we're talking about the land here between the pool and the railway line. Correct. Near Audi and up to where the railway station is. That's the land, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, true. So are you looking, this is council land? So I didn't I, know this was I, council land. I hear you're surprised there. Well, yes, and there I was surprised is, when yes. I found out about this, yeah. and I didn't find out about it with this meeting, but found out about it previously. The last council bought this parcel of land. Now, I don't why? know why. I haven't been able to find any strategic okay. document, any business case. I've been told by someone just the other day that anecdotally they heard the council bought this for some overflow parking from the swimming pool. It's a decent car park. Now, they paid several million dollars Oof. for this parcel of land. Wow. And I would say, gee, Surely there must be another pay. reason for it. Yeah, I don't know. I, okay. I have no reason. I have no strategic reason. There's no business reason. plan or there's no strategic plan. I haven't been able to find out. any documentation around okay. the exact reasoning that it was bought. Happy to be shown that if anyone's got yeah, that information. Absolutely. So we've got there. And so council has now quite rightly said, well, we've got this parcel land. We don't know why we've got this parcel land. What are we going to do with it? Hmm. Now, some people don't like the idea of selling council assets, even though there's no reason to buy the council Mm. asset in the first place. Mm. So the process here will be that we'll go out and advertise, again, an expression of interest process to sell that or Mm. to lease it. Now, Mm. it was pointed out at the meeting on Thursday night that it's probably um, difficult Mm. to lease I was say, is, is a it, blank pass of land, but it, it can happen. Option? I suppose some people may look at it from that point of view, but I would think the more obvious option would be to sell it. Quite possibly. And then mm. that'll be a decision for council once we get those EOIs to come mm. back and say, do we want to sell it now? We've got a, an offer to buy or we've got an offer to lease it. Mm. What do we do with it? But again, it seems like a lot of money to tie up from a council perspective for no income at the moment and no long-term purpose that we can work out at the moment. So yes. that's the process now. EIs will go out for both of those two, and then they'll come back to council to make a decision on those two, and hopefully that'll put a few dollars back on the bottom line. Whichever way we go with both of them, mm. that'll put a few dollars back on the bottom line of council. Yeah. At the council meeting, Matt, uh, there was a notice of motion of rescission for the AOD, the Alcohol and Other Drugs Facility there. Now, I'm assuming this must uh, be around um, the decision that was put forward during the course of the last council meeting, um, or an option that was put forward there going back a while, about going to New, Cal- uh, New South Wales Health and asking them about uh, or proposing two new blocks of land. But these blocks of land have been options that have been put forward already. It appears as though New South Wales Health has come back and said, look, no, you've already come forward with these options. Uh, we've, we've dismissed them the first time around. Um, so what's the rescission motion about now? So you're right. It was July, the council meeting in July, there was a motion put forward. It was a fairly lengthy motion, nine points to that motion. And that basically talked about the fact that all the different sites, the 19 sites mm. that have been put forward had so far been rejected by yep. Western New South Wales Local Health District. So that was really an acknowledgement of that. But during that meeting, there was an amendment put forward, so it became the, the final motion. There were a couple of points for put forward in that that talked about the CEO taking all the necessary steps to facilitate Western New South Wales LHD and New South Wales Health or and all New South Wales Health assessing land in two specific sites, North Bungalgumby Road and Greengrove. And so basically look at those for suitability and come back to us with some information from mm. that. So that was all on the 27th of July. Mm. Now, on the 3rd of August, we as in council received a letter back from the CEO of Western New South Wales Local Health District. So on New South Wales government letterhead, signed off by Mark Spittle, the CEO of Western New South Wales Local yep. Health District. It was a three-page letter, but I'll paraphrase one of the important parts that council has picked up on from that letter. It said, and I quote, I note that both land parcels identified in the resolution have been previously assessed by the LHD 
and that the LHD has previously provided advice to both council officers and councillors regarding both of them prior to the council meeting on July 27th. Hmm. In other words, he's saying, well, we've You've already, already told shown you. these blocks. That's yeah, that's right. right. Yes. And, and we've told you they're not acceptable. Yeah. Almost, why are you asking for it again? Hmm. But it goes on further in the letter. And essentially, if you're going to do a detailed analysis of a site again, which presumably they've already done hmm. that, then there's a cost there. And I think... Western New South Wales Local Health District is saying, well, why are we going to be incurring these costs? Yep. Because councils ask for resolution. And I'm so assuming they, they're not cheap costs either. Well, I'll tell you this part of the letter. Another part of the letter said, furthermore, it is feasible that detailed site surveys covering all of the various types of assessment could cost $100,000 or more wow. per site mm. based on some of the information contained in the report to council. I request that the Dubbo Regional Council share equally with the LHD, the cost of all geotechnical, environmental, planning and legal due diligence required to thoroughly assess, assess formal land offerings. And the council acknowledges that any remediation required arising from such diligence activities remains the sole responsibility of council as the landowner. So wait a minute. So basically councils in a situation now where the LHD is now pretty much stated to them, number one, You've already shown us these blocks of land, and we've already turned around and said they're no good, but they're, they're not sort of fitting into our criteria what we need. Secondly, if you want to pursue this as an option with us, it's going to cost you money, a significant amount of money. But remember, we've already turned around and rejected these blocks of land. So basically, if you want to go forward with that resolution of council, mm. $100,000 or more per site, so that's $200,000 wow. or more. So that means council will be paying half of that. At least from the sound of things. That's right. Well, more. we're paying half, whatever yeah. that amount might be, so $100,000 yeah. or more up yeah. the council. So based on that, that made some councillors then say, and again, that letter was received on the 3rd of August. Mm. Some councillors said, well, gee, I don't know that we want to go and spend $100,000 to get the answer that we've already received before. Yes. Is that the best thing to do with public money? Then further on the 18th of August, Ryan Park, who's the Minister for Regional Health and Minister for Health, sent a letter to me, which I then distributed to all councillors, and he said, I am advised that correspondence has recently been sent from the Western New South Wales Local Health District to Dubbo Regional Council following the passing of a further resolution of council on 27 July. Mm. So the new minister knew about the letter from yep. the CEO, yep. and so if anyone thought, well, maybe the CEO was just going out and making up stories, I don't know why a CEO would do that. The health minister there from That's the right. South the, the health minister said, I acknowledge that letter's been sent, yeah. so aware of that. So based on all of that, a rescission motion was brought forward, and there's a very technical process, mm. and I think in this term of council, this is the first rescission motion I can certainly remember coming forward. So mm. it was a bit of a technical process to, to actually go through that process. Yeah. And so essentially what happened to the rescission motion is it needs three councillors to lodge a rescission motion, yeah. which occurred. There were three councillors who lodged that, put that forward, and so in our business papers we had that rescission motion, and that was debated. Now what happened to the rescission motion is that you go through, you debate that, and if you decide that, yes, you're going to go forward with it, it basically wipes the previous motion. Okay. So the rescission motion was to remove that 27 July motion of council, yep. which that means... we're going to put forward those two blocks of land again as an option, is that right? That was the main part of that, because again, now with additional information, now I am mm. talking on behalf of other councillors here, but essentially it seemed to me that the fact that we had additional information mm. to say that, well, your resolution would then incur costs on saying something you already knew, then councillors, some councillors said, mm. well, we don't feel comfortable with that as a way of going forward. So let's rescind that. Mm. And so that was a debate, a fairly long debate. You yep. can go and watch the video if you like from yep. Thursday night. But from that debate, that rescission motion was successful. In other mm. words, then that wiped it. Then you needed another motion to replace that effectively. Mm. And so then the motion that was put forward and that was approved by council on the meeting at the meeting on Thursday night was now that the CEO undertake no further action as a result of the advice received from Western New South Wales Local Health District dated 3rd of August 2023, advising that, quotation marks, both land parcels identified in the resolution have been previously assessed by the LHD and that the LHD has previously provided advice to both officers and councillors regarding both of them prior to the council meeting on July 27th, close mm. quotation marks, mm. comma, and that advice stated that Bungle Gumby Road and Greengrove sites are not considered suitable. Mm. So that was the new motion put forward. That was then resolved by council. So that's the position of council as we stand today. So the most obvious question now is, where are we in regards to all of this? What's, what's, what's our next step? Nothing's really changed mm. through this whole process because... 
I don't know if you're sure we've talked about it before, but the state government will decide where to put their facility. I think facility. we may have mentioned it once or twice, or so, three or four times. So just to clarify, mm. if the state government decided tomorrow, yep. next week, next month, that they want to bungle Gumby, they'd come and knock on our door and they'd say, we'd really like bungle Gumby. Now, logically, we would probably sit down and say, right, let's work out how we do that. Let's work yep. out the size of the, the parcel land you need and negotiate that process. Or if we dug our heels and said, if you're not having it, mm. They've got compulsory acquisition mm. powers. Because yeah, it's been put on record, of course, the fact that uh, WA Regional Council is opposed, in theory, to uh, obviously Spears drivers being the option. That's been put forward already. It's been clearly stated that's the case. Not opposed in theory. Opposed, full stop. There's a formal uh, resolution of council to say that we oppose Spears drivers. So that's a resolution of council. Yep. So, yes, we as a council have resolved. So that means the opinion of council is we oppose Spears Drive as a location. But, and some people have said to me, why are you putting the AOD facility on Spears Drive? Or mm. why don't you put it somewhere else? And again, I've stressed and I'll stress again now, council cannot decide where this facility goes. Mm. Council does not have the power to tell the state government where to go. The state government is building their facility. It's yep. a state government-owned facility. It's a New South Wales health facility. Yep. They'll put it where they want to put it. So has there been any indication to you at all, Matt, in regards to when they're going to make a decision on this? No, no, not at all. And technically, you might say they made the decision. Mm. They made the decision back in February when they made the announcement that they were going to Spears Drive. Mm. So they technically made a decision then. Now, there's been a change in government since then. But you remember we talked about the fact that it was only a couple months ago they bought the Spears Drive location. Mm. Now, and that was the Department of Health or, or New South Wales Health bought that particular location. You would probably say if they're going to buy that location, they're buying it with the full intention mm, of putting the, the facility yeah, on there. Absolutely. Now, again, there's been all this debate and discussion in, in the community and there's been fingers pointed at council that it's all your fault that it's there. But again, mm. I don't accept that at all. I can't see anything that council has done that has made New South Wales Health go to Spears Drive. And if there is anything that we've done to make it go to Spears Drive, tell me, because I would yeah. love to know how I can control the state government. Yeah. There'd be lots of things i do that if I had the power to control the state government. Absolutely. But I can't. The best I can do is say, please. And we've done mm. that with a letter that we've sent off on the back of that resolution to say, we formally oppose Spears Drive. Please move the location yeah. to somewhere else. And that's the extent of our power when we're telling the state government what to do. Yeah. Well, let's hope. Let's truly, truly hope the fact in the next couple of weeks at least, New South Wales government turns around and gives some direction in regards to how they want to move with this. And keep in mind, part of that previous resolution, there was a meeting planned between Council and Western New South Wales mm. Local Health District, and that was set for the 31st of August. That meeting will still go ahead. That meeting's in the diary of the CEO of Council and the CEO of yeah. Western New South Wales Local Health District. So they'll go ahead. They've already had that discussion. We've got the yeah. meeting set. We'll go ahead. They'll discuss, who knows, but mm. there'll be a discussion there. And again, the CEO will put forward that we oppose Spears Drive and Western New South Wales Health, Health District CEO can say, this is what we're doing. But mm. again, at some stage... Hopefully, yeah. they need to make a decision because Absolutely. what I'm also hearing from parts of the community is that we need this facility mm. and people are dying mm. because we don't have this facility. And mm. if we can have something to stop people dying or to make people's lives better, yeah. we should do that. So certainly, I would like to say it, and the community said that, yeah. and even people in Spears Drive have said, we need this facility as soon as possible. Yeah. People in Spears Drive obviously said we don't want it there. We're saying we don't want it there. Yeah. But we still say, please get on and do it. Oh, to the New South Wales government who are listening, make a call. All right, mate, it's that time of the week. It's the time for the lyric of the week. So what do you have for us today? Couldn't help but the jail... Having my youngest daughter there sitting in solitary assaulting. confinement with you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's understandable. I think a lot of parents probably at some point in time in their life want to put their kids in solitary confinement. Why not? So this week I've got a guest speaker for our Limerick for the Week. A guest speaker? So Who have we got? Well, I thought given the fact that my youngest daughter came along with me, laid there in solitary confinement in the very eerie environment, <laughs> I've written the Limerick for this week. And I'm going to bring my daughter in to actually deliver the limerick for the week. My God, I love the way you punish your kids. As old Dubbo Jail tucked in bed, no. for Vinny's I'd face my own dread. But the ghost whispered near, saying, Why are you here? And I wished I were home instead. Beautiful. Oh, I love the fact we've got a little bit of a guest speaker in here today. Our little bit of a guest poet as well. Thank you very much for that, George. That was absolutely 
Well, folks, until next week, everybody, I want you guys to go out there and take care. Straight from the Mayor's Mouth with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council.